Well, you know, um, I wore the brightest shirt I could find today for a reason. Because I believe with all my heart the church has a really bright future. Jesus Christ promised, he promised to perfect this church. And here's the amazing thing. Jesus Christ asked us to partner with him in the building and strengthening of his church. Six weeks ago, I shared a message entitled, Leave It Better Than You Found It. Uh, by that, I meant leave your church in better condition than when you first attended. Yes, leave your church in better condition than you last attended. And during that message, I said that we could do such, we could leave the church better than we found it by doing five very specific things. And the first thing was simply this. Seeing yourself, seeing ourselves as part of the church. See, if you placed your faith in Christ, you are a member of the one church that exists on this globe. There's only one body of Christ. And you know, in a very real way, their membership is not optional. If you are a believer in Christ, you are part of his great big church. And if you truly see yourself as part of it, you're much more likely to love it and serve it and care for it than if you see yourself, well, that's their church. Friends, the church, you're part of it. Therefore, every time you pass the church, pray for it. And that's my second point. We can leave the church better than we found it by praying for our church. Prayer is a ministry, you might say, an instrument, a means that God has given to the local churches for their strengthening. And that's why Paul keeps exhorting us to pray for one another as he says, always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Friends, prayer is kind of like something we just do all the time. When you see someone walking down the street, pray for them. You see them in the mall, pray for them. Just live in an atmosphere of prayer. And furthermore, I think you know this to be true. When you pray for people, you begin to care more deeply for them. Because friends, in a very real way, prayer changes our hearts. Thirdly, I said we could leave the church better than we found it by forgiving those who offend us. You know, on occasion we will offend one another. It's inevitable. It's part of who we are. We are not yet perfected. Yes, on occasion we'll fail to love people as we should. And so if someone has offended you, fail to love you as they should, forgive them. And if you can list, let it go, let it go. But if you can't let it go, go to them for the sole purpose of being reconciled to them. And please, do not pass on your hurts to other people who are not part of the problem or part of the solution. Trafficking in another person's mistakes is not a kingdom value, but forgiveness most certainly is. Fourthly, I said this, we could leave the church better than we found it by loving our church family in just those practical, practical ways. Friends, there obviously there's countless of ways that we can love one another, and I, I catch you guys doing it all the time. Bringing meals to those who are ill, or maybe have just had a baby. Helping cater, catering memorial services, and we've had eight of them this year already. Visiting shut-ins. Helping people move hospitality, and the list just goes on and on of these practical ways that we can love the church. You know, friends, when Paul said this, that love is the greatest, he wasn't kidding. Because Paul knows that love builds relationships, it builds marriages, and yes, it most certainly builds his church. And finally, I said this, six weeks ago, I said that one of the great ways we can leave the church better than we found it is simply by all of us in our hearts allowing Jesus to be our leader. Ongoing submission to Jesus Christ. Friends, I believe this with all my heart. Although our church has bylaws and a constitution, so we can do things decently and in order. But friends, the church is primarily, I want you to hear this, a dynamic and living organism that moves and acts at the direction of Jesus Christ who dwells us by his spirit. So if we're all really staying in touch with Jesus, we'll keep doing the things we need to do to build up the local church. Therefore, friends, let's keep submitting to Jesus. He is the leader of our church. And yes, friends, all the above advice is found in Paul's letter to the Ephesian church. 
And in fact, if you sit down and read it, it takes about 15 minutes to read, you'd find another dozen things that Paul said, here's what you can do to leave the church better than you found it. Amen. Submit to one another out of Christ. Uh, putting others first, speaking the truth in love, creating an atmosphere of thanksgiving, just to mention three more. There are so many things we can do to leave the church better than we found it. But today I want to move beyond how. I, I want to move beyond how we can leave the church better than we found it to the why. Why, in fact, should we try to leave the church better than we found it? And once again, I'm going to seek an answer to this question solely based on Paul's letter to the Ephesian church. So I'm going to encourage you to uh, find a handout in your bulletin here this morning. And it simply is why we should love and serve the church. And on that handout, you'll see number one. We should love and serve the church because of whose it is. Because of whose it is. As we read in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 23 and 22 and 23. And God placed what? All things under his feet. And appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body. The fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Now that, those two verses are loaded, right? They, this is a big idea a verse. In fact, there's four big ideas there as I see them. First of all, that God has given Jesus Christ dominion over everything on this planet. Now, as Dave said last week, the kingdom has come, but not in its fullness yet. The kingdom has been inaugurated, but not culminated. So at this point, we see people resisting Jesus Christ. But one day, he will no longer be resisted because every knee will bow to Jesus Christ. Secondly, God has given Jesus Christ the right to rule over his church. It's his church. And thirdly, the church is Christ's body. And fourthly, Christ fills the church with both his presence and, yes, his gifts. Now, I do not have time to explain each of these big ideas, but I want to focus in on the third one. The church is Christ's body. The church belongs to Jesus. It's his. He owns it. Therefore, when we talk about our church, we do in a limited sense of the word. Like some drive as our church is in the sense that it's where we attend, it's where we serve, it's, it's the group of people we partner with in the gospel. But it's only our church really in a limited sense of the word because ultimately it's Christ. He owns this church. And because it belongs to Jesus, friends, we should treat it really well. You know, when I was in my early 20s, my dad had a Dodge Duster. And it had a fairly powerful engine in it. And on occasion, he would loan it to me. And you know, as someone 20, 21, I was tempted to drive it fast. Because it went really fast. But you know, I, I didn't. Because it wasn't mine. It was my dad's. And my dad, had, well, I really respected my dad. He was a good man. It was his property. It wasn't mine to race. And so I say, friends, how much more should we respect the property of Jesus Christ? This is his church. The church belongs to him. The one who this whole planet will one day bow down to owns our community. And therefore, friends, I am so motivated to care for it and love it. Secondly, and you're going to have to work with me on this one. We should love and serve the church because the church is God's chosen instrument to fulfill his purposes. As we read in Ephesians chapter 3, and these are some really big ideas, friends. This is really kind of gets exciting to me. His intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, I want to tell you, I do not fully understand this passage. But friends, when Paul says that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, he is saying that we, the church, have a ministry that extends beyond the borders of this world. You might say the church has a rather lofty and cosmic ministry, a role to play in God's great plan. Friends, People obviously watch the church. Other human beings observe what the church is doing. But friends, according to this passage, 
The church is also being watched by rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, which I understand to be fallen angels and demons. And heavenly realms should not be seen so much as a place, but as a spiritual dimension that we do not see. We have a limited understanding of our world. We do not see everything. And what exactly is this manifold wisdom of God that the church is making known to these rulers and authorities? Friends, it's nothing else or nothing less than the gospel itself. The mystery of the gospel is this, that through faith in Christ, Jew and Gentile become one. And I love this about the gospel. It breaks down racial barriers. And I suppose that's why I'm enjoying the increasingly international flavor the Summit Drive. When we get all our international students back, friends, we had 37 different nations represented here on October 5th last year. I would have never dreamed that that would take place in a town like Kamloops. You think about Vancouver, a very cosmopolitan city. But here in Kamloops, we have the world coming to us. Let's embrace these international students like never before. Friends, together we have a great ministry. In the words of Klein Snodgrass, the church's very existence and conduct are making known how great God's plan of salvation is, both to people and to powers. And I think that's why articles like, believe it or not, it's pretend church is so tragic. I caught this article last week in the San Francisco Chronicle, August 4th, 2015. The church is pastored by a guy named Mustafa Khan, and he does a pretend church service on the weekend. It's a non-religious service. Uh, the music is songs by Madonna and the Spice Girls. Sermons were on friendship, which is not such a bad idea. But when they come to communion, friends, they use a local bakery for its bread, and then they use Paps Blue Ribbon beer. And in many ways, they're, they're mocking the church. Although Mustafa Khan says some interesting things. He says people are dying for community. And that's one of the reasons we exist, friends, to have create a community. And so I can only pray, I, I'm glad I read this article, I can pray for that community. That they discover what the true church is all about. Amen, Amy. Friends, we've been called for a great purpose. The church is God's chosen instrument to proclaim to the world what God has done, is doing, and will do in the future. It is therefore so important that we recover the importance of the church as a place where the purposes of God are embodied and the unity that God is seeking is practiced. Yes, we should love and church, serve the church because, friends, we have a great purpose. And now thirdly, we should love and serve the church because when we do so, and this might seem a little self-motivated, we're loving ourselves. Now, Paul doesn't come right out and say, hey, if you love the church, you're loving yourself. But he certainly teaches the concept. For example, in Ephesians chapter 5, he says this. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. And you know, the older I get, the more sense that makes. You see, when a husband loves his wife, he, he's loving the marriage. He's loving the, the, the union that he joined when he said, I do take you as my wife. I will on occasion hear someone say this. In fact, I'll say it myself. Happy wife, happy life, right? <laughs> you hear guys say that once in a while? And I think there's truth to it. However, when men say that, they're usually not thinking biblically or theologically. <clears throat> but when Paul calls us to love our wives as ourselves, he is in fact thinking biblically, theologically, because he understands marriage to be what? A one flesh relationship. And a one flesh relationship, friends, is this inseparable, exclusive relationship between a man and a woman. Therefore, when a man loves his wife, he is in fact loving the union the marriage, the relationship that he is vitally and exclusively part of. It's always in a man's best interest to love his wife. And that's why Paul can say, he who loves his wife loves himself. Now let me take it a step further. 
In like manner, using the very same logic, I would argue that to love the church is to love yourself. Because the church is also an inseparable, exclusive relationship between all who are vitally connected to Jesus Christ. If a person has faith in Jesus Christ, they become part of the church. Friends, we are brothers and sisters in Christ. We are a family. We're going to spend eternity together. And I think almost every Sunday morning, Debbie reminds me of that. Debbie always comes up to me and says, I'm your sister. I'm your sister, she said. And I said, you're right. I'm your brother. I'm your brother. Debbie gets it. We are family, and we're going to spend eternity together. Therefore, <laughs> therefore, to love the church, friends, is yet another way of truly loving yourself. Fourthly, and people struggle with this one. We should love and serve the church because we'll be rewarded for doing so. Now, admittedly, we struggle with this concept because, you know what, most of you guys are so captivated by this term called grace. You just love grace. God's unmerited favor towards you. We know that we're saved by grace and that by grace he helps us overcome any obstacle or coming our way. And so when we think of grace, we just can't get our heads around rewards. Is there a way around this? Well, I think there is. First of all, friends, never give up on the concept of grace. You are saved by grace. If any community you happen to visit suggests that you are not saved by grace, kind of just back your way out the door. We can never earn what God has given to us in Christ. Absolutely not. But here's another amazing concept. By grace, he wants to reward people for even a cup of cold water given in his name. Yes, we're saved by grace. And by grace, he'll even reward us. That's why Paul says this. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord. Not people because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do, whether they are slave or free. Now in this passage, Paul is addressing slaves. <clears throat> brothers and sisters in Christ who found themselves in slavery. And he instructs them to serve well, to serve enthusiastically, and to serve their master as if it was Jesus himself. And we shouldn't miss this point because I think it's, it's a radical point when it comes to doing your job. Whether you're a farmer, a plumber, a building manager, or customer service, everything you do is to do it as Jesus was your boss. And I can remember the story I read about 25 years ago about a lady named Sophie. And, and Sophie scrubbed floors in the Chicago train station. And, and people asked Sophie one time, Sophie, how come you're always smiling when you're cleaning these dirty floors? And, and Sophie responded, I'm scrubbing these floors for Jesus. And, and Sophie got it. And I think that is a way of transforming anything we do. If, if we're doing it as if Jesus was our boss. But friends, I didn't want to talk about that so much as to come back to the promise in this verse here. Jesus actually promises us rewards for everything done in his name. So whether you're a slave or a non-slave, whatever good thing you do, he will reward you. The Lord himself will reward each one of you for whatever good they do. And what would those rewards be? I haven't got a clue. But I can tell you this. If anyone knows how to reward someone, it would be Jesus himself. Amen. And now fifthly, and I've intentionally saved this for last because I think this is the ultimate reason why we should love and serve the church. Here it is. Christ gave his life for it. Christ gave his life for it. As again, we read in Ephesians chapter 5. Husbands, love your wives. And then here's the key phrase. Just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for it. You know, when you read in Ephesians 5, you're never sure if he's talking about marriage or the church. Because he puts the two together. Husbands, the gospel teaches us, models for us, how we are to love our spouses. We're to love them like Christ did in sacrificial ways. We're to go out of our way to meet their needs. To bring them happiness. And most importantly, as Paul will go on to say, to help them to become everything that God is calling them to be. Something Timothy Keller calls the mission of marriage. Friends, I, I think if people grasp this concept, most marriages will be transformed because 
Typically, we operate in marriage as like, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. And Paul says, that's too small of a goal for marriage. The goal in your marriage needs to, you need to help that lady or that man in your life become everything that God has called them to be. Force them, encourage them to use every gift, every talent that God has given them. That's what Christian marriage is all about. Now again, friends, the reason I refer to this verse this morning, however, is not to talk about marriage, but rather to remind us that Christ gave his life for his church. And therein lies the value of the church. Friends, if Jesus Christ would give his life for the church, should we not also give our time and our energy to make it a better, richer place? For me, the, the, the price God was willing to pay to establish the church motivates me to love the church like nothing else. Friends, when you think about the church, I always vision a cross behind it. In fact, when you see other people walking down the street, envision a cross behind it. That declares to you that person is so incredibly loved by God. Let me conclude. As I said in my opening remarks this morning, last time I spoke, I focused in on what the book of Ephesians had to say about how we can leave the church better than we found it, how we can love the church. Now this morning, I really wanted to move beyond that, focus on, I think, the more important question. The, the more important question is why should we? Why should we love the church? And I say it's the more important question, friends, because knowing how to love the church is one thing, but nothing will keep you going like knowing why you should. And it, it applies to marriage, too. You, you can know 100 things you need to do in your relationship to your spouse. But the more powerful point of motivation is to know why you should love your wife or your, or your church. See, in other words, friends, I see understanding why we should love as the greater source of motivation. Although, friends, it's not bad to know how as well. About a year ago, Annamika Neufeld gave me this book it's entitled Why We Love the Church, written by a sports writer and his pastor. Presbyterian pastor in Michigan. And basically it's a response to all those people who are saying, I can do the Christian life without the church. I don't need church. I'll just walk with Jesus and I'll go to Starbucks and meet my friend. And so basically it's a response to all literature that's being written sharing that basic concept. Well, as I read the book, it kind of prompted me to ask the question to myself, well, why, why do you love the church, Harry? And I started writing, and I came up with about 20 things. Let me just highlight a few of them. I, I, I can't help but love the church. I came to faith in Christ through the church. And a little tiny church plant with 30 people on silver, really hard chairs. <laughs> <laughs> and, and secondly, I was profoundly loved by the church when I wasn't on their page. I was just a teenager hanging out with people who cared for me. And they loved me, even though I didn't have faith, even though I wasn't a worshiper. There's such significant men in that church who cared for young men, hiking, oh, so much fun, so much fun. Thirdly, friends, the church is continually teaching me how to worship. I need to be taught how to worship. And the church does that for me. The church continually calls me to repentance. I think repentance is one of those great words on the planet. It's simply to have a change of mind and go the right direction. And every time I hang around people in the church, I'm learning how to repent, and it's a good thing for my soul. <clears throat> Fifthly, for all the ways the church loves people, you know, I, I get a good advantage because I'm around here a lot, so I see all the things that people do behind the scenes. Some of them are worthy to be on NL radio as a top story. Some of them are worthy to be in the, the, the local paper. But you know what, they're not going to make it there. Because you would never want them to be there. You just want to do your thing, quietly behind the scene, and sometimes you get caught doing it. Sixthly, I just love the way the church has helped me to apply the gospel to all of life. And really, the gospel is to be applied to all of life. That's why Dave's series on the other six days is so important. We are always trying to apply the gospel to our jobs to our neighborhood relationships. The gospel applies to everything. 
Friends, we've given, we've been given many reasons why we should love and care of the church. And reasons that are rooted in what God has done, is doing, and has done for us in Christ. And in my understanding, there's no greater reason to love the church than the value it was given when Christ died for it. The church belongs to Jesus. It's his. He promised to build it. And yes, it's his chosen instrument to bring his message of love to this planet. And apparently to the unseen world as well. So let's love it with everything God has so richly given us. He's given us the gift of time. It just seems to be flying, doesn't it? He's given us some energy. He's given us talents. He's given us gifts. Let's use them for his purposes. And let's love it regardless of its imperfections. Yes, let's love it because Christ really does love the church. And he demonstrated for us his love for the church when he gave his life for it. Amen. I'm going to invite the worship team to come back and close our service here today.